on a two-lane road, and they, that couple was a younger couple, and they were sitting so close together, just, oh, you know. And uh, the wife said to her hu- husband, you know, we used to ride around that close. And he said, I ain't moved. <laughs> And Christ has not moved. Um, He loves us as He's always loved us. Amen? He wants a relationship with us. He desires that. He left glory, robed Himself in flesh, lived a pauper's life, was ridiculed, accused of being a demon, a devil, attacked on every hand, threatened to be stoned, sometimes thrown off a cliff, accused of being a blasphemer, only to be rejected after all the kind and miraculous works of healing that he did, and uh, suffer, bleed, and die on a cruel cross, alone, because he loves you. And uh, if there's a great need in America today, it's for Christians to get closer to our Lord. And I, I, I want to make an appeal to you this morning, uh, and I'm including myself in this appeal, that we begin to earnestly seek for a closer relationship with God. Uh, we need revival. This world needs revival. Amen? Amen? And that's the answer to America's need, the church getting right with God. But that starts with us, right? So let, let's look at an example of this in Second Kings chapter number 22. I want to skip down and start reading in verse number 8. And Hilkiah the high priest said unto Shaphan the scribe, I have found the book of the law in the house of the Lord. Isn't that a shame that the priest had lost the book? The word of God. They were operating without the scriptures. You know what? A lot of churches are doing that today. They're operating just on their own thoughts and desires. And that's one of the reasons that the church is in the state that it's in today. And Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan and he read it. And Shaphan the scribe came to the king and brought the king word again and said, Thy servants have gathered the money that was found in the house and have delivered it unto the hand of them that do the work. They have that had the oversight of the house of the Lord, and Shaphan the scribe showed the king, saying, Hilkiah the priest hath delivered me a book. And Shaphan read it before the king, and it came to pass, when the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. And the king commanded Hilkiah the priest, and Hiakim the son of Shaphan, and Akbor the son of Machiah and Shaphan the scribe and Asaiah, I'm, that's how I'm going to pronounce it, a servant of the king's son, go ye, inquire the Lord for me and for the people and for all Judah concerning the words of this book that is found, for great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according to unto all that was written, all that which is written concerning us. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning, and I do thank you for the Word of God. Lord, forgive me of my uh, misreading of it even this morning. Help me, Father, as we look into this passage of Scripture, Lord, to gain from you insight and understanding. Lord, I know that you desire for each of us to take a step in your direction. Lord, some of us need to hit this altar and repent of how we've treated you, Jesus, and how we've ignored you, lived our own life as though you did not even exist. Lord, others who are pursuing you, Lord, they're still not where they ought to be and where they need to be. And I pray, God, that you would help us all to be convinced by your word uh, that we need to renew our effort in pursuing Christ and getting closer to Christ. Lord, use your word to accomplish that this morning and give a spark of revival. Even in this service, Lord, in our hearts, 
fan the flames of revival and help us, God, to respond to you today. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen. Israel, at this point, was already in a state of apostasy. I mean, they had gotten as far away from God as you could imagine. Manasseh, the grandfather of Josiah, just one chapter prior to this, is recorded of the evil deeds that his grandfather, Josiah's grandfather, did. Look at chapter 21 and verse number 4. This is Manasseh. He built altars in the house of the Lord. Chapter 21, verse 4. And he built altars in the house of the Lord, of which the Lord said, In Jerusalem I will put my name. And he built altars for all the hosts of heaven, in the two courts of the house of the Lord, and he made his sons pass through the fire and observed times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Listen to verse uh, number 7. And he set a graven image of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers, only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded them. Listen to verse 9. But they hearken not Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. And the Lord spake by his servants, the prophet, saying, Because Manasseh king of Judah hath done these abominations and hath done wickedly above all that the Amorites did which were before him and hath made Judah also to sin with his idols, therefore... Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah that whosoever heareth of it, both ears shall tingle. I mean, this is a... This is a... They're at the point of final judgment. You couldn't get any more backslidden and wicked as Israel has become. One of the reasons he sent them into the promised land was to stop all the evil that was going on. All the debauchery that was happening in that land. God said, I want my people to go in there. Utterly wipe out the inhabitants. I'm tired of all the gross, wicked sins. And by the way, the sins the Amorites were committing, were they were uh, uh, slaughtering their babies. Throwing some of them in the fire at worships of false gods. And now... The king of Judah has done worse than them all. Well, Manasseh does somewhat repent. And then his son takes over the reign. And he doesn't live but two years. Now I want you to try to imagine you're an eight-year-old child. This is what's going on everywhere. When there's idolatry, the idols are in the house of the Lord, people are committing all types of sin and wickedness, your own father's life's been cut short because of the great evil that he has even committed. And would you think in those days, maybe God will send revival to our nation? There's very few people that would think that, right? Right, Brother Lewis? I don't know too many people that even look at our world today and see what's going on in America and the world and they're thinking, maybe God will send revival. You know what most people are thinking? Brother John, they're thinking, well, I mean, it must be the end of the world. And so, let's just kind of sit back and wait for Jesus to come because things can't get much worse, right? Right? The truth is, we don't know when our Lord's going to come. He may come today. 
He may come tomorrow. He may come ten years from now. Listen, He may come a hundred years from now. He may come two hundred years from now. And maybe now is the time that He needs His people to call upon His name and earnestly seek His faith. Maybe there's not revival in our land because His own people are not responding to His invitation to get closer to Him. When you see all of this wickedness that's going on in the world, it is, it is a loud call to the Christians to get right with God. My temptation is to point my finger at others. Is that your temptation? I mean, if this party wasn't doing that, if this political movement wasn't doing that, if so-and-so wasn't funding this, and we can point fingers at everybody, but the truth is we need to stare at our own face in the mirror and say, you know, it starts with me. I'm the one. It's my own heart. My lack of an earnest, sincere, diligent pursuit of Christ What is my heart issue? Why am I in the condition that I'm in? And even in this state, in this day, Josiah's day, there is a great revival that takes place. Things can change. Amen? Things can be turned. Revival can come. It could come to you. And by the way, it's not all that hard and difficult. For some reason, we think spiritual renewal is some kind of like climbing a high mountain and, you know, one-handed. And it's just so hard and it, and it can't be done. And preacher, you know, I've, I've done well spiritually at times and I'm, I'm still kind of where I'm at right now and so why should I give a, an effort to, to it? Because souls are at stake. Amen? Young people are coming up and they need to see real Christianity. Not just sitting in church and going through the motions and hearing sermons and singing songs and then going home and living like basically every atheist lives in the world, you know, for whatever's next. Spiritual renewal. It's not that hard. It begins when Josiah is only eight years old. If you read... In 2 Chronicles chapter 34, you'll see that when he was 16 years old, it's before he gets the book, when he was 16, he's already throwing out the idols. He's already going about saying, no, you burned those idols up and the false prophets that worshipped and promoted these idols, you dig their bones up and you burned them on these idols and he was already moving to turn uh, Judah back to God. At the age of 20, he started a renewing, a renewal, a renewal of building the tabernacle again. He was cleaning it up, cleaning it out, and restoring it. Yes. Offerings were being taken, and the offerings were going to that work. They weren't, there wasn't fraud. They, they weren't taking that money to do something else with it. It was going for what it was intended to do, restoring the house of God. Amen. And in that restoration effort, when he's 20... They find the Bible. You know, it's sad that they refer to it just as a book. I know Bible means book, but when he starts reading out of it, he says, it's the book of the law of the Lord. It wasn't just any book, amen? It was God's Word. So I want to give you three little simple steps for spiritual renewal. First step is just to receive the Word of God. Receive the Word of God. We're not exactly told in the Bible how it was lost. Isn't that interesting? All the activities are still going on. They're still doing their partial worship, their corrupted worship, their compromised worship, right? They're going in the temple, still offering up these uh, uh, requirements that the Lord has instructed them to do. problem is they're offering up right beside false gods. They're just going through the motion with all the false gods surrounding them and with not the Word of God to guide them. I can't help but think that's kind of like our day. Right? 
You go to places of worship and it almost appears to be a bar scene at night. Strobe lights, and rock and roll music. and You know why that, why that is such an attractive thing? Because there's something in our flesh that loves excitement and thrill and we think, boy, that must be where it's at. I know y'all don't know me that well. I, I'm, I'm actually an introvert. I know it's hard to believe, but I am. But I do get excited at easy like a book, uh, football game and stuff. I remember my brother-in-law Asa was playing flag football. And I played, you know, helmet and shoulder pads. And he said, come out to one of my games. And I thought, this, this is not going to be very exciting, flag football. And so I went out there and was sitting in the bleachers and he's playing. Next thing I know, I'm on the sideline. Next thing I know, I'm at the end zone. Go! Go! Yeah! Good job! Like, oh well, I guess it is pretty exciting. <laughs> I went to hear a Christian group sing and, and boy, that was just, I mean, a blessing. And I was like, Amen! Woo! <laughs> That's good, Amen! Afterwards, a lady from Assembly of God Church came up. She said, what church do you attend? We want you to come to our church. And I was just excited. I, uh, things like that do move you, but things that move you are not always the Spirit of God. We should be excited about Christ. The sad thing about it is when you mention Christ, people's thrill thermometer goes down to cold and zero even though He's the only answer for us. Amen? Receive the Word of God. What did the king do? Did he say, I don't want to hear that? I'm not interested in that. Let, let me contrast him to, to another king. Remember in Jeremiah's day, they brought the Word of God to the king in Jeremiah's day and he read three or four pages and he took out a pen knife and cut it in half and then he threw it in the fire. I'm telling you, you and I need to receive the Word of God. We need to hear the Word of God. We need to listen to the Word of God. We need to read the Word of God. We need to meditate on the Word of God. We need to consume the Word of God. That's our greatest need is to hear and, and, and listen and and read the, the, the Scriptures. And that's what the Bible says over and over and over again. Right. And by the way, yeah. that simple truth has been preached until I think even Jesus is saying, I've told them Tommy, time and time again. Thank you. No Bible, no revival. Amen. No Bible, no no revival, no scripture, no spiritual renewal. It cannot take place without you putting your nose in this book. It's not just hearing sermons once a week. Think about that. Our, even our hunger for hearing the Word of God has just waned. We, we, I'm telling you, we want almost anything else but just hear. What did God say? Tell me what God said, preacher. It starts with our hunger for the Word of God. I'm, I'm afraid we're like Samson. Samson was given great power, and you've been given great power. But Samson didn't realize that when he played around with sin, it was dangerous. He didn't realize the effect that it was having on him because he didn't sense any loss of strength. That's our problem. We've given, been given great power. We each, all of us who are saved, have the Spirit of God living on the inside of us. And we play around with sin and we don't realize that we've been sapped of our strength. We think... Hey, things haven't really changed much for me, Brother Bruce. Jesus. I mean, I'm not in a bad state at all. Right. Read Judges chapter 16, verses 1 through 3. Samson goes down and sleeps with a harlot yes. in Gaza. Talk about it. And then the enemies, they come around the gate 
And they said, in the morning, we're going to kill Samson. And at night, Samson gets up after he's been with a harlot, after he's broken the law of God, he goes to the gate, rips the gate off its post, puts it on his back, and goes to a hill in Hebron. When you say, well, I, 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 I don't know how much that gate weighed, but he walked nearly 38 miles with it. You look it up on the map yourself. 38 miles. Look, now it was powerful to rip it up and just set it aside. And he'd just rip it up and set it aside. He walked 38 miles with it. And I think he thought every step, I'm okay. Look how strong I am. I could just keep on going. It doesn't bother me. And we don't realize what's happening. If you read Judges 16, 1 through 4, 1 through 3, you think, wow. I mean, he went and slept with a harlot and he still has this great power. Read verse 4. Verse 4, he is introduced to Delilah. And that's what's going on in the church world today. We, we, take, we go to church, we get stirred up a little bit, then we go home and we lose our Bible and we can't find it. We neglect it. We don't read it. we got all the opportunities in the world. You can read on your phone. You can have your phone read it to you. You can read it on the computer or you can have the computer read it to you. You can hear, listen to it in your car. I mean, you, we've, got, we've got more advantages to hear the Word of God continually than any other generation, and we listen to it less and less and less. And we wonder, why is the church in the state it's state it in? You know why a lot of churches are doing some of those things that, like the lights and the... Because they want God to move. They don't want to stay, stay small. They want to help people... There's a right motive, and they're looking for the answer. Would you say that? How many would agree that? They, they, I want to do. I don't want to stay like this. I want help. What can we do? Other people have done this, brother Lewis, and it worked great for them. So you know what they say? Let's try that. Nothing else seems to be working. Am I telling y'all the truth or not? But you know what we're unwilling to do. And unwilling to try. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Where do you find that word that comes from God? We find that in this blessed book of the Bible. Amen? Amen. Man cannot live just by bread. Physical food is not enough for you. It will not sustain your spiritual man. Your spiritual being is far more important than your spiritual, I mean your physical being. Spiritual is more important than your physical, right? But how much time do we spend on the physical? And how much time do we spend on the spiritual? The physical, it's necessary to care for this body because... God gave it to you. But your spiritual well-being is far more important than this flesh. Amen? Amen. Amen. Have we forgotten the word of Hebrews 4.12? For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Preacher, I want to know God's will. You know what people, most people are doing when they, and, and this is true, I mean across the board sometimes. Most people who want to know what God's will is, you know what they're doing? They're grabbing a bow and arrow and sh- cl- sh- uh, closing their eyes and just shooting in the dark. And they don't even know what they're aiming at. When the Bible says of itself, it's a discerner, the thoughts and intent of your heart, it'll help you know if you're really looking for God's will or not. It will. What does it mean to be quick? It means it's alive. Powerful. It's working. It's active. Here's the living, active Word of God and it's being neglected. And when Josiah heard it, oh, how it affected him. Amen? 
And on and on we can go. In Deuteronomy 6, remember, the parents are to get up in the morning, talk about the Bible. When they, when they get to breakfast, they talk about the Bible. When they go outside, they're to talk about the Bible. They put scriptures on the door, above the door, on the sides of the door, all in the house, all throughout the day. When's the last time all throughout the day you were talking and thinking about the Word of God? How many of you have been, went days, days, weeks without ever even considering one single passage or one verse? And we wonder what's going on. Ray Comfort says when people come to him and say, listen, can you give me some spiritual counsel? He says, my first question to them, when they come to me and ask for spiritual counsel, my first question is, have you read the Word of God? And he said most of the time their response is no. He'll go to church services sometimes and he'll say, if you read your Bible every day, I want you to raise your hand. Don't do it right here. And he said 90% of the people in that congregation cannot raise their hand if they're honest. And he said, and I've had people raise their hand only to come to me after the service and say, I'm sorry, I, I wouldn't tell them the truth because the Spirit of God convicted them of that lie. And we wonder why we are not powerful. Why we're not changing. It's not going to happen if you don't receive the exhortation this morning to get in this book. Receive it. And secondly, you notice what Josiah did. He believed it. It's not just hearing. Hearing. It is, I acknowledge this. It is God's Word. I believe it. I believe God is going to do exactly what He said He was going to do. I'm afraid because we have sinned. We've, we've done exactly what He told us not to do and now we're facing wrath and judgment. He believed so much to the point that He ripped His garments. Look again at verse 11. It came to pass when the king had heard the words of the book of the law that he rent his clothes. He said, oh no, we're in trouble. We have sinned greatly. We, we are going to suffer. God is angry with us. We have disobeyed Him. He, he actually believed that. And I'm trying to get you to see that you can't neglect this book and think you're going to do well. Well, preacher, I haven't. You know, I've got a good family. Things are going all right with me. No, they're not. No man can say things are going all right with him if he's not in the Word of God and he's not believing what he's reading in that Word. This is not just a book of a man's opinion. This is the inspired Word of God. Again, I remind you of the King. Josiah's response was to rip his garments. Jehudiah's response was to take a penknife, cut it up, and throw it in the trash, in the fire, so it would be burned. <laughs> Tearing your garment or ripping up the scriptures? What, what do you think the attitude and mindset of the world is today? Ripping up the scriptures. You say to them, God said this, and they say, No. That's not that's not. That's an old book. That's written thousands of years ago. The applications of this book to your life are life changing. It would bring a radical reform in your heart if you would just open up this book and believe what God has said. I forget what preacher said this, but he said one day some simple-minded man is going to open up the Bible and believe what's written there and embarrass all the rest of us. We need to stop arguing with the Bible. We need to stop denying what the Bible says. He said, preacher, how do we get in such a mess in society? where there's 20 different genders. I mean, they may be more than that now. When God said in the beginning that He made them male and female. How did we get there, preacher? Because people just no longer believe what's written in the Bible. 
Okay, and by the way, I'm not I'm 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 just saying this to be honest with you. All the multitude of versions, I mean so many of them out there, has aided in that confusion. If you talk to a man who's in the Muslim faith, he says about our Bibles, he says, Listen, the whole thing's corrupt. How many different versions do y'all have? And what is your response to that? Let me quickly, I'm, it's not part of the sermon. One response is, those are translations. <laughs> the Greek is the same. The Hebrew is the same. You may have a lot of different translations, but the text is the same. Amen? That comes from two different sources. I'm not going to give that, but the text is pretty much the same. Amen? But you, if you're not careful, you will lose confidence in the Bible. And where does that come from? Let me tell you where it comes from. It comes from the devil himself. In the beginning, God said, don't you dare eat the tree of, the, uh, of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for in the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And Satan slithered in and added just one word. He said, you shall surely not die. And we're all in the mess we're in because Satan messed with the Word of God. And we wouldn't believe the Word of God. It's God's Word declared. He means what He says. You know why Babylon comes in in Jeremiah's day and destroys Jerusalem and the walls are torn down and the temple is ransacked and burnt? You know why that happened? Because God said if you do the evil that Manasseh did, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to destroy the cities and I'm going to take you away out of it into captivity in a strange land. And God did exactly what He said He'd do. Jesus came exactly like God said He would. He died on the cross just like God said He would. He rose from the dead just like God said He would. And He's coming again just like God said He would. If it's in the Word of God, you better believe it. Because if you don't, it's at your own peril. It's simple. Isn't that pretty simple? I go to the Bible... And I start listening to what it says, and then I believe it. And there's one other step you need to take. Then you need to obey. Yeah. And I ask yourself, you ask yourself this question: When's the last time? When's the last time I got on my knees and changed something in my life because of what the Word of God Amen. dealt with me about? Yes. Yeah. Can you think of the last time that happened to you? The truth is, for all of us, what happened to trips to the altar? Have we gotten too prideful to bend the knee and say, God, I know what you want from me in this service. I do know. And I will say yes to being obedient to you. That, that used to be a common thing. People would come to the altar. People come to the altar. You know what I believe with all my heart is as it was in the days of Noah. We're listening to preaching now like it's entertainment. Yes. We want to laugh a little, cry a little, you know, be a little happy, a little sad, and then we want to go home. But we don't want to change. Yes. And we walk away. And then we come back next Sunday and we wonder, what is, what's going on? Where is God? Where is the power of God? Why should God show up if we're not going to do what He's been telling us to do over and over and over and over and over again? Why should God show up if we're not going to do what He's told us to do over and over and over again? Listen to me. And it's not the, it's, it's the basic things that he's instructed us to do. That we're just... It's the things that baby Christians would obey and respond to and it would become a part of their life. And now it's those, even those baby things that, that people say, oh, When people meet Christ, the first thing they want to do is get baptized. And the, and the night he changed my heart, I wanted to get baptized. 
As things changed in my life, there was a desire to obey Jesus when I got saved. That desire is still there because the Spirit of God lives inside of me. And He is... He is earnestly desiring that I would obey Christ. He's working... And by the way, you're not going to be satisfied holding the hand of the world and Jesus' hand at the same time. You're going to be a miserable creature trying to do that. You have to choose. I would, I would to God we'd all choose this morning to let go of the hand of the world and grab Christ. And just simply say to Him, Lord, whatever You say... I will do it. Yeah. Whatever you want, that's what I want to do. Hear it. Receive it. Believe that it come from God. Remember Paul's preaching in Thessalonians. I preached you the Word of God. And he was impressed and he thanked God because they didn't accept it as the Word of man. You know what's going on today? This is what church is all about. God lays a message on the preacher's heart. The preacher delivers that message to his people and then his people say, Yes, Lord, I heard you. And I'll be obedient. Or they say, Well, that was interesting. And they walk out in disobedience. We've got to get back to, to, to the time when we hear the Word of God and God deals with our heart and we bend the knee to it and say, Yes! And if we don't do that, revival will never come. Could we have revival? Absolutely. Is it hard? No, it's real simple. Receive the Word of God, believe the Word of God, and obey. And you know all the passages, right? James chapter 1, Be ye doers of the Word, not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 7? I'll tell you about two people, two foundations. Some people build their life on the thoughts and philosophies of man. It's sand. It's sand. It's sand. Some people believe they build their life on my word. My word. The people that build their life on what the opinion of men are. And by the way, if you stop and think about that just for a second. So many people are changing their views about major things just because the world is pressuring you to change your mind about it. When you've got the Word of God to stand on. Okay, you can let them change your mind and just go along with them, but when the crisis of life comes, your life will fall apart. If you stand over there on the words of Christ and the crisis comes... No matter how severe that crisis, your life will stand because it's built on a solid foundation. Amen? <laughs> Let me end. <laughs> how many of you know R.A. Torrey? D.L. Moody was a great evangelist and Torrey came right behind him. A wonderful Christian man, a powerful man of revival. He wrote this about revival. He said, first, let, the, let a few Christians first let a few Christians they need not be many get thoroughly right with God themselves revival always starts there but a few they, they don't have to be a lot just a few get thoroughly right with God themselves you know what? we're worried about what's going to happen with society and what's happening in politics when really we should be worrying about ourselves and getting thoroughly right with God ourselves. <laughs> Notice he says this is the prime essential. The prime essential. Second, let them bind themselves together in prayer, in a prayer group to pray for revival until God opens the heavens and comes down. First, let them get thoroughly right with God themselves. This is the prime essential. Second, let them bind themselves together in a prayer group to pray for revival until God opens the heavens and comes down. Amen. Third, let them put themselves at the disposal of God for Him to use as He sees fit in winning others to Christ. And then He says, that is all. That is all. It's been taken by many churches 
many communities and in no instance has it ever failed. And then he concludes, and it cannot fail. Amen. Spiritual renewal, revival, and it's real easy. Get your nose back in that book, believe what it says, and obey it. And you'll experience revival. And listen to me, and you'll encourage others to experience revival themselves. Amen? Let's stand for prayer. Father, please help us. This is the critical moment of this service.